Hello, everyone. Welcome. We're going to allow just a few minutes as everyone is let into our webinar. And then we will proceed with introductions and getting right going into our action packed program. So just giving a few moments to let our folks come in. Welcome, everyone. We're excited to have you with us today. We have lots of cases and interesting insights from our panelists. So we're just uh, those of you who are connecting. We're just giving a moment to let everyone who has registered into the room and then we will proceed. All right, we're gonna have a couple folks still joining us, but I think we've reached a critical mass. So we will get going and we'll have some introductions. So folks will have some warm up time. So it's really wonderful to see everyone today. Thank you for joining us. My name is Katie Barrettwick. I'm a partner at Sal Ewing, officed in our Minneapolis office. I have a commercial litigation and appellate practice and have the pleasure of serving as one of the vice chairs of our firm's national appellate group. I'm very pleased to be joined today by my colleague, Lauren Schoberl, who also is officed in our Minneapolis office. Thanks for being here, Lauren. Welcome. Thanks, Katie. It's nice to hear from you. Lauren is a senior associate in our litigation group, and she also has an emphasis in her practice on labor and employment. And she does a lot of appeals. She is a former law clerk to the Minnesota Court of Appeals, and she's a graduate of the University of Wisconsin and William Mitchell College of Law. I'm also particularly um, impressed with her leadership because she has been elected by our associates as the chair of our firm's nationwide associates committee. So that is a testament to what um, Lauren's peers uh, think of her. So that's great, Lauren. Yeah. I also have the pleasure of introducing our panelists who I have gotten to know through the years in numerous ways and I can attest to each of their legal acumen and thinking. And now that they are in house, their strategic um, advocacy and thinking on behalf of their companies. Uh, and they're all just really nice people. So thank you so much for being here. I'm going to start with you, Kate. Um, I think probably the panelists that I've known the longest. Kate is head of litigation at Chegg. She's a graduate of Northwestern University and the University of Wisconsin Law School. We got two badgers in the mix here. Uh, she spent seven years in private practice as a litigator and then two years, oh, that was at two national law firms. And she also spent two years as a federal uh, district court clerk. She spent a little more than four years at Optum, which is part of the United Health Group corporate family before becoming head of litigation at Chegg last summer. It's nice to see you, Kate. Thank you for making time to be with us today. Hi, thanks, Katie. Hi, everyone. Next, we have Jason Britt. Hi, Jason. Nice to see you. Jason, nice to see you, too. Hi, Katie. Good. Nice to confirm your sound is good, too. Jason is Assistant General Counsel at Textron Specialized Vehicles, where he has worked since 2018. He lives and works in Augusta, Georgia. We have a nice geographic representation across, um, across our, our um, footprint today. Prior to being at TSV, uh, Jason was a commercial litigator at a national law firm for more than seven years based in Chicago, where he focused on commercial litigation. He's a graduate of North, Northern Kentucky University and Northwestern University School of Law, two Northwestern connections here. Thank you for joining us, Jason. And last but certainly not least, hi, Fred, nice to see you. Hey, Katie, how you doing? Nice to see you. Um, Fred is Senior Counsel of Product and Litigation at TaskRabbit, and he lives and works out of the New York City area. He joined TaskRabbit in early 2020, and before that, we have a, sorry for you transactional lawyers, we have a litigation-heavy panel, but given that we're talking about the Supreme Court, I suppose that's not shocking, because Fred was also a commercial litigator for several years, six years, I think, at two major national law firms. He is also a federal, former federal district court law clerk. He's a graduate of Skidmore College and the University of Michigan Law School. So nice Big Ten representation here. Thank you for joining us, Fred. And Fred deserves particular props because TaskRabbit has two weeks a year, I believe. Is that right, Fred? That's that's right. Yeah, this is our this is one of our vacation weeks. Fred is taking a break from his manda mandatory <laughs> vacation week and wellness recharge week to be with us. So you deserve extra props for that. So thank you, Fred. And Lauren is going to give some basic housekeeping information about our webinar before we launch into the substance. All right, thanks, Katie. So um, thing number one is we have a Q&A tool, which should be at the bottom of your screen. So questions can be submitted throughout the program through the Q&A tool. Um, we're going to attempt to cover a lot of material today. 
so to the extent that questions or time allows, we will try to integrate your questions into the program. Um, but don't let that stop you. Um, if you, we're very interested to hear what you'd like to know. So please submit your questions and we will do our best to address them. All right, so regarding the CLE. So today's program has been approved for one and a half substantive CLE credits in the following states. Delaware, Florida, Illinois, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, and applications are pending in both Minnesota and Virginia. As a CLE provider, Cell Ewing must be able to verify your attendance. So throughout the program, there will be some numeric codes displayed on the slides. We will um, draw your attention to those uh, codes and read them to you as well. So please make sure that you record those codes because we will ask you to report them back to us. So there will be a survey that you, like a link to a survey that you will have received in yesterday's reminder email, but the survey will also pop up on your browser when this program ends. Please complete that survey. In that survey, you'll be asked to enter those numeric codes and that will verify your attendance. And once we have verified your attendance, we will send you the certificate um, of the completion of this program. Um, so please be sure to respond to that survey within five days of today. Um, following the webinar, you will also receive an email that will include links to the recording of the CLE as well as some materials, in other words, the slides. And because we're all lawyers in good company, we have some legal disclaimer. So um, we're, I'm just going to read it. Okay, the provision and receipt of the information in this program is not legal advice, does not create a lawyer-client relationship, and should not be acted upon without seeking professional counsel who have been informed of the specifics of your situation. Back over to you, Katie. Thanks, Lauren. And we are experiencing a little bit of challenge with your sound. Um, you're cutting in and out just a little bit, Lauren. So, and you, and so if you could maybe move forward a little bit, uh, sure. and yeah, just try to center yourself a little bit. If Kate has a suggestion, maybe pointing away from your cabinet or so. Anyways, you, I'll, I'll take care of it. You will. All right. Well, moving forward, if you could advance a slide, please. And one more time, please. All right, so we briefly want to frame our goals for our session today. We will, Lauren and I will be covering some of the main facts, the holding, the setup of the cases we'll discuss. We're hoping to get through 10 or 11 cases, but because we want this to be something different than just sort of the laundry list of cases, which we feel like many other CLE providers provide, we really want to get to our panelists and we want the focus to be as much as we can today on the practical implications and what they as in-house counsel see, not just for their own companies, but also thinking about things and identifying risks and sort of strategic next steps, action items that they see from their sort of perspective and worldview as in-house counsel. So at times we are going to be very cursory because we want to, we'll, we'll tell you the holding, we'll tell you, you know, sort of what the new rule of law or the clarified rule of laws, but we will not be doing a deep dive. And we can refer you to two sources. One that we find, um, I know Lauren and I often rely upon the SCOTUS blog. If you Google search SCOTUS blog or whatever your browser of choice is, um, it is high quality, a lot of uh, Supreme Court practitioners, excellent commentary, and importantly, links to all of the uh, briefs filed in every Supreme Court matter and the opinions. Also remember that the US Supreme Court's own docket is actually, well, of course it should be, it is publicly accessible and free, and you can also get those materials there so you don't have to pay for it through a service. Uh, so those are two resources if you'd like to do a deeper dive. I would also note before we advance the slide, we see our first CLE code here, which is 43219. If you could make a note of that on a sticky note or wherever your uh, method of make it take a screenshot, make sure make a note of that. So um, this will be one of the two you will need. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so this is, an, is my sound better now? So far it is. Okay, so these are our nine justices. And this is a historically unique court in ways that are we can see and that aren't visible right away. So on the one hand, the, from what we can see is that it's demographically a more diverse court. This is the first time that the court includes four women justices, first time there are two black justices, and the first time we have a black woman. And um, as you can see, it's 
that white males are not in the minority, or the majority in the court. And from what we can't see, unless you've been following the extensive news coverage, um, is ideologically a less diverse court. So six of the justices were nominated by Republican presidents and three by Democratic presidents. Go to the next slide, please. We're gonna zero in on Justice Jackson because this is her first term. She joined the court about a year ago in June of 2022. Um, she is currently the only Biden nominee on the court. She joined the court after about eight years um, in the district court for the District of DC. And her first term is not over yet, so we can't really speak to what her track record looks like. But the New York Times did put together this pretty informative graph that shows us that she's been very active so far in oral arguments. So this graph shows how many words each of the current nine justices have spoken during their first eight oral arguments. And as we can see, Justice Jackson is uh, far ahead of the pack. Um, some comment commentators uh, chalk it up to she's just, this is just her style. She just is going to talk a lot on the bench. Um, others are um, take the position that she's staking out uh, where she falls on certain cases and communicating to her fellow justices uh, where she lies on certain issues with all these words she's speaking. Next slide, please. And this is me. So what is probably also not gone unnoticed to most of you um, being lawyers is that we are seeing a bit of a crisis with the way that the court is perceived in the um, court of public opinion, if you will. With cases and decisions like the Dobbs opinion, which uh, upended more than 50 years of federal constitutional law, recognizing a federal constitutional right to access abortion care. Um, we see this sort of emboldened conservative majority um, being willing to go places where public opinion are not in, not, you know, not in alignment with public opinion. And we've also, of course, seen um, more even just today from ProPublica, um, some ethical concerns about connections between some of the justices and major political donors and funders. Uh, the news today relates to Justice Alito and some reporting about very high-end fishing trips. Um, also important to note that uh, Justice Alito had a pre-buttal. Um, he must have had, you know, known ProPublica, I'm sure let him know or some of the sources um, and has a Wall Street Journal pre-buttal to, to those, uh, that reporting. Um, but we do know that as an institution, there can be no doubt whether we um, like the direction ideologically of the court or not, there can be no doubt that the, our country and our constitutional democracy looks to the court as a key institution. And it matters when there's a lack of confidence in, in that and any other major institution in our democracy. So this is a concern. Um, and, and I think this is one that, um, you know, not just practicing lawyers, but um, but in-house counsel also have to think about. And so I was wondering if any of the panel, just to start you out on a nice, easy topic and nice, easy question. Um, and, but the question is sort of, or the, the series of questions is, how has this tumultuous period at the US Supreme Court impacted your work as an in-house counsel? Um, is there any strategies or any experiences you're willing to share that others might benefit from um, about this sort of challenging time in the history of the institution of the court? Fred, are you willing to kick us off on that light and breezy topic? Uh, yeah, thanks, Katie. Um, and uh, before I get to your question, I just want to say thank you to you and everyone at Saul Ewing for organizing the CLE and inviting me to participate. I, um, I really appreciate it. Um, now, um, as for the question, um, obviously, several recent and upcoming Supreme Court cases, as well as legislative actions in many states have the potential to directly impact the personal lives of employees. Um, in my experience, in-house legal departments can really lead the way for companies to help get in front of and address uh, some of these issues. So, um, for example, in-house counsel might draft internal communications in anticipation of some of these cases that reaffirm a company's mission statement and or its diversity principles. Um, with a lot of these cases, there's the benefit of time knowing that they're coming or with Dobbs seeing a draft of the opinion in advance. Um, and as counsel might identify opportunities for a company to sign on to a letter or some sort of other statement of public support. Um, In-house counsel might consider hosting some sort of internal workshop 
to discuss significant cases with employees and provide a forum to support them. And in-house counsel might also consider ways in which the company can position itself to provide benefits or other sorts of support that might counteract some of the effects of these opinions. All of these are examples of ways in which in-house counsel can really help a company's diversity and inclusion, uh, diversity and inclusion efforts and, co and contribute to creating a culture of belonging at a company. Um, I think the key here, which seems simple, but in my experience can be easily overlooked, is just remembering that employees are humans. They're not just workers um, who are impacted by things that occur outside of work and finding ways to support them wherever possible. That's great, Fred. Thank you for that. Um, Kate, how about you? Do you, do you feel that in-house counsel have a role to play in this kind of managing these tumultuous times in terms of what the court is doing? Thanks, Katie. And um, of course, ditto to everything uh, Fred said. Thanks for having us and putting this uh, great CLA together and, and welcome everyone. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's an interesting time to be in-house counsel. Um, and I think what I've seen, and it's been, you know, a little over six years in house and just in that short period of time for me, you know, legal counsel is sort of squarely having to address what maybe were traditionally clearly only legal issues or clearly only social issues. And the two are merging under a lot of these cases and falling onto legal's plate. And so, you know, I think historically maybe HR would handle some of the, the social stuff if it, if it bubbled up or you know, marketing might deal with you know, some, some kind of these issues. But um, I mean that not only does legal sometimes have to step into the fray and lead on these topics, but they can really add value by jumping in and leading even if they're not asked to because it's where all of these things coalesce, right? The legal brain, the social, and taking care of you know, the entire company and employee population that, that we otherwise, um, in a way we wouldn't have to, so. Jason, how about you? Is there anything you're willing to share about what you um, see or think might be helpful for in-house counsel? Sure, and, and uh, you know, before I jump in, I'll, I'll join Kate and Fred in uh, thanking you for having us and uh, uh, putting this program together. Um, yeah, I, I mean, when I look at uh, some of the impacts of you know uh, some of these shifts in the court, some of the you know. Uh, uh, cases touching on social issues that have been decided by the court. And, and I'm thinking here principally, but not exclusively of, of Dobbs and the overruling of Roe v. Wade. Um, I mean, we are a company that, as you mentioned earlier, is based in Georgia. Um, and I think, you know, uh, as, as I sit as an in-house counsel for a company with a large workforce in Georgia, one of the things that I'm seeing, especially coming from a background where I used to work in Chicago, Illinois, was located in a state that, you know, certainly has one uh, view towards reproductive rights and the rights that are impacted by Roe and Dobbs, um, to being in Georgia, which as a state uh, has, you know, I think I, I think I can safely say a different approach to those rights. Um, you know, I'm now with a business where there are people in different locations that may be impacted differently by these mm -hmm. rulings and where there may be, you know, very real impacts to people mm -hmm. in one location versus another. Um, and so one of the things that I think we have to consider is when we are looking at attracting talent, when we are looking at retaining talent, when we are looking at, you know, frankly, you know, just to jump off of some of the things Fred and Kate said, doing the right thing by our employees, um, we kind of have to now consider in a way that we didn't under row, um, do we have to uh, extend our benefits? Do we have to do things to, you know, uh, overcome social hurdles that have now been set up for some of our employees in a way that we previously didn't have to consider. So mm -hmm. in that way, these, these um, you know, socially impactful cases are, are changing how we um, have to do business as in-house counsel. Well, and I can imagine in some instances really requiring a response, right? So, I mean, sort of a non-response is a response, yes. right? And managing that though. Yeah, I, I mean, response. 
Go ahead, Jason. It, exactly. And, you know, I, I think there's a historian who put it in terms of uh, you can't be neutral on a moving train. Um, that's uh, mm -hmm. that's that's kind of where we find ourselves here. Yeah. All right. Well, I do think it's, you know, there were two cases. So I should also say, before we go further into the depths of this term, that there are a number of cases that we'll touch on today. There's about 20 still pending to be issued by the court, and there will be some opinions we think released tomorrow, and then also additional ones next week. So some of these, for instance, the affirmative actions in cases about whether race can at all play a uh, specific role in admissions to colleges and universities, that is pending. And um, we have some important decisions we have already issued, but um, many to come. And it is, I think, worth noting that there, there were instances this term in, for instance, the Voting Rights Cases, Voting Rights Act cases, and then just last week, the Indian Child Welfare Act, where there was a very real concern around Native communities and um, those who are, you know, allies that, that the court, the majority might essentially eviscerate the Indian Child Welfare Act, which requires, um, you know, in light of the history of separating, um, destroying Native communities of being cognizant of having tribes play a central role of keeping native kids in the child welfare system in native families and with, with the tribes wherever possible. Um, and and the, the majority did notably show some restraint and, and issue in that sense, some surprise rulings in the Voting Rights Act case and the Indian Child Welfare Act cases. So I think we don't, we can only read so much into the oral argument. And um, I'm sure all of you know that there's times where things go a different way. Kate, did you wanna pop in on that? Yeah, I just wanted to piggyback on that. I think it brings up a good point that um, sort of one effect of the slide that's sitting in front of us is that some of these decisions Katie just indicated come out totally different from what everyone would have expected for decades. So I, I've seen a really important role of in-house counsel is working with communications teams and like preparing the media statements um, and you know providing that legal guidance interpreting what it can mean when it comes down different ways because the communications folks of course, have a you know a very different lens that is not as legally nuanced, and so you know instead of the emergency, <laughs> whatever Dobbs is a great example, helping yeah. those folks prepare the different possibilities and understand the nuances of what can come out the other end of uh, otherwise maybe uncertain <laughs> court rulings. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. Thanks, Kate. Okay, next slide, please. All right, Lauren, you're going to get us started with our first substantive case and some discussions with the next steps. Great. So our first case is Helix Energy Solutions Group versus Hewitt. This is a labor and employment matter that involves the Fair Labor Standards Act. So I'm sure all of us have varying levels of familiarity with the FLSA. And um, I'm imagining most of us are familiar with the requirement that employers pay time and a half to employees for hours worked over the standard 40 hours per week work. So there, as we all know, there's also exceptions to this overtime where if an employee is highly compensated and who meets other certain requirements, like they perform at least one qualifying function and are paid on a salary basis, they will be exempt from this overtime requirement. So the background of this case <clears throat> is that uh, I'm getting a note that I'm having sound difficulties. Okay, I'm so sorry, it's the fan on my laptop. Um, why don't we jump to the next case and and I'll dial in, I'm so sorry. That's that's fine, Lauren, we'll, we'll do that. We'll come back to Helix. Um, I'll turn to the first of our sort of technology cases and then if we get you back on uh, sort of a more stable sound, we'll, we'll talk about Helix because we do want to highlight that labor, labor and employment. But let's move into what's a series of cases, although only one was decided by the court and the other was remanded back to the appellate court in light of the decision. So these are the cases of Twitter versus Tomna, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, that's the case that was decided. And then Gonzalez versus Google, which is the case that the court remanded back to the appellate court in light of its decision in the Twitter case. But in short, the, the Twitter case was an instance where the plaintiffs were either victims or the family of victims of some really, really, you know, terrible terrorist attacks around the world from ISIS and is other- not available. Countries. At the tone, please record your message. When you finished recording, you may hang up. I don't know where that's coming from, but um, I will just keep going. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. As we talk about the tech case, we are humans and also continue to experience some tech challenges. So um, the plaintiffs sued, they, they used an international criminal statute 
and were sued for aiding and abetting. And the theory of the, the case was that ISIS and other of these terrorist groups that had killed and, and harmed their, um, their themselves and their family members um, had been aided and abetted by the platforms where um, they had every reason to know that ISIS and others were using Twitter for recruitment. Um, and so it was really a, a creative, um, but in light of very few other avenues for seeking any remedy. Um, and I think also really wanting to change some of the practices um, was seeking to hold the social media platform accountable. And at least in the Twitter case, um, this is actually a, a unanimous opinion. We have a, a number of those we'll talk about today, but a, unanim an, a unanimous opinion rejecting that, um, not allowing the case to advance past the pleading stage um, and making clear that Twitter could not be, at least under this federal statute, could not be found liable for aiding and abetting. Now, Justice Jackson filed a concurrence and in her concurrence noted what she believed to be the very narrow holding. So while I think there is a takeaway of um, tech companies and others who might face um, allegations or potential claims for the content that others who use their platforms might put on them. I think we will see the lower courts um, a little bit struggling to, to determine how narrow or broadly um, to apply this, this case. Um, but I think there's some, the, the Google case actually deals with a different statute um, and that, in fact, deals with the um, Communications Decency Act and the Section 230. And so I think the appellate courts will, will be tussling with this. So there's more to come. Um, Lauren's reporting that her audio is, is back. So, but we're going to finish up this case and we'll jump back to your Helix case, Lauren. Um, so let's turn to, I've done um, probably too much reporting <laughs> um, on the case, but let's, let's see, Kate. What about you? I mean, Chag is a tech company in the education and other space. Um, do you have any high level reactions to this decision? Do you, what do you think about what the plaintiffs attempted to do here? And what do you make of the court's rejection, at least in this circumstance? Thanks, Katie. Yeah, this, this case is so interesting to me. Um, I, I guess first thought as in-house counsel I had on sort of all of these cases, you know, as, as all of you who are, who are listening in, who are in-house, well, no, we can't know everything that's going on out in the legal world. We can't track all the cases. We can't track all the developments. And so I love these Supreme Court, you know, recaps because they're good reminders to us of like, you know, sort of the traditional law school issue spawning. Um, so even cases that aren't directly on point to anything that we're handling every day sort of trigger these reminders of like things I need to keep on you know, my radar is in-house counsel and know when to reach out because I know that I don't know <laughs> what I'm talking about. And um, this one was, you know, similarly one of those ones where I thought, okay, like terrorism, uh, I don't know, this has nothing to do with me. This has nothing to do with anyone in-house. Um, but when I started thinking about it and looking at it, it, it sort of reminded me of um, a super important issue for in-house counsel, which is plaintiffs using uh, tech or other sort of statutes uh, in the tech world to bring claims that you otherwise wouldn't be thinking about here, right? So I think most of us probably will never have much to do with this specific case here. Um, but, uh, you know, even if like Jason's company makes, makes machines, but we still have, we all have websites, we all have tech presence, we all have internet presence. And, um, you know, I you see cases pop up with plaintiffs bringing claims under the Wiretap Act, and you think wiretap, like, you know, CIA listening in on communications, but actually if you have a chat bot, right, there's a whole slew of cases saying that's wiretap, um, about wiretap violation, um, or, you know, some cookies and tracking software, um, ADA lawsuits, I'm sure many of you have heard about mm -hmm. you know, technology that's supporting uh, the visually impaired. Um, so to me, this case was a great reminder of where these legal claims can kind of come out of nowhere into everyday operations and become very quickly uh, very painful and very applicable to you. Um, and so, uh, you know, even though it didn't really um, come down sort of in a way <laughs> that would is, was a problem for these tech companies, I'm right. certain not a uh, good day when they got this lawsuit. So, Yeah, right. Great points, Kate. Lauren, let's test out your audio. You want to, and um, Maddie, can you go back to the Helix slides, please? There you go. All right. I think I'm back. Yay. 
Okay, so let's try this again. So this is Helix Energy Solutions Group versus Hewitt. I'm not sure how much everyone heard, so I'm sorry. We're just going to go through it again. So this case um, treats the Fair Labor Standards Act and the overtime requirement. So many of us may be familiar with the FLSA for its overtime requirement that employers pay time and a half to employees for time worked above and beyond the 40 hour per week work week. There's an exception if certain boxes are checked, if an employee is highly compensated, if they perform at least one of these qualifying functions listed out in the regs and are paid on a salary basis. So the background here is that plaintiff worked for two years for defendants um, working well over uh, 40 hours per week. He was paid pretty handsomely. He made a daily rate of $1,000 per day. And at the end of the year, he had he made well over $200,000 each year. Um, push came to shove, the relationship soured. Uh, plaintiff sues defendant, claiming entitlement to overtime, so that time and a half for all the hours that he worked in excess of 40 hours per week over the course of his two-year employment. Of course, Hewitt said, no, you don't meet the exemption requirements because you're paid on a salary basis, you're highly compensated, and you perform an executive function that qualifies. Um, so the question before the court is, is an employee paid a salary when they're paid for the days that they work, so on a daily rate? And are they thus exempt from the FLSA's overtime requirement? Next slide, please. So Justice Kagan wrote a pretty textualist majority opinion um, holding that a salaried employee under the FLSA is one who is paid the same amount in a given interval, so in a given week or month or two week period. Um, so they're paid the same amount regardless of the hours or days that they actually work during that interval. So for example, here, plaintiff was paid on a daily rate. So he was paid only for his days worked. So if he worked one day a week, he would make $1,000. If he worked five days a week, he would be paid $5,000 on his paycheck. So because his income varied and was not predictable in a given pay period, he was not salaried and was therefore entitled to that two years of overtime at a, a pretty substantial rate of pay. So, of course, the obvious takeaways from this are that the court has narrowed and clarified for, for all of us what the executive exemption is to the overtime requirement, and that employees don't lose the FS FLSA protections just because they're compensated well. So, um, my first question here is to Kate. So, this holding appears to be pretty narrow in its scope and application. So, that is, there's not a lot of really highly paid daily rate workers in most workforces. But nevertheless, is there a broader lesson here for in-house counsel? Thanks, Lauren. Um, yeah, so this is another one that sort of made me think like, this is a good issue that might come up. Not every company is going to sort of have this at play today, um, but really made me think of one of the core value adds is in-house counsel is making sure the structures, processes, systems are in place. So that if things change, um, say the business, you know, needs to deal with a money crunch or they're trying to recruit um, new employees who they otherwise wouldn't have, but they're creating flexible, interesting, different working arrangements. You know, you want to have the systems in place that take into account holdings like this so that when those things are happening sort of outside of your uh, range of vision as in-house counsel, you've got the guardrails in place. Right. Yeah, thanks, Kate. That's, um, yeah, those one-off sort of exceptions that might be made could end up having pretty monumental consequences for an organization with a holding like this. Okay, and so Jason, so what about those organizations that do not and will not have any daily rate employees in their workforce? What sort of issues could you see um, where this could be implicated? Sure, Lauren. Uh, so, so, I, I, I mean, I, I will say my first reaction when I saw this case was was that uh, it seemed pretty unusual that you would have a highly compensated employee 
who is uh, compensated on a daily as opposed to an hourly or a salary basis. So I didn't, I, I, at first I was looking at it and not seeing a lot of application to our business where you know we don't really have a daily compensation structure for, for anyone. But what I can see coming up, and as I thought about it a little bit more, is that, uh, you know, we do have, um, you know, for example, consultants or other independent contractors that we may work with, where there may be a little bit more creativity in some of those compensation structures. And I think, you know, there there is an industry on, uh, you know, in certain parts of the bar of challenging, you know, alleged misclassification of hourly independent contractors and saying this person is not an independent contractor, they are an employee, and thus they are entitled to overtime under uh, the FLSA. And and sort of what I see is a, you know, something potentially that we need to, um, you know, we as in-house counsel generally may need to evaluate is where we have those consultants, where we have those independent contractors who may be getting compensated on either a daily or some other non-salary type basis. Um, it's probably worth looking at those and evaluating those sorts of relationships for risk in a misclassification type action against our employers to see, you know, are the, does, does this case, does Helix Energy now give those independent contractors uh, a new weapon to go into court and say, I'm being misclassified and I'm entitled to overtime under my arrangement with, uh, with our employers? Yeah, that's a that is yes. Checking and making sure that everyone is classified correctly, especially as I don't know if we've been all watching, but the NLRB has um, has recently issued new guidance on uh, the factors that go into independent contractor classification. So keeping on top of that is um, is smart, especially in light of this holding. Thanks, Jason. Next slide, Anyone? please. Yep, and let's go ahead a couple to, there we go. Thank you so much to the Jack Daniels. All right, we're gonna talk about a pair of cases. The, deck, the Jack Daniels case is decided is a trademark infringement case. And then the Andy Warhol case, which we'll talk about next um, is a copyright case. And in terms of processing and, and, um, and analyzing with our panelists, we're gonna talk about them together because they have some, some strong similarities. So in both the Jack Daniels case and in, and in the Andy Warhol case, we have an overwhelming win and a very robust, confident court analyzing intellectual sort of core substantive intellectual property law um, and, and coming out with decisions that I would, I see as strengthening the rights and the litigation position of intellectual property holders um, and raising some possible potential new risks for individuals and companies that um, may in the past have thought that they were engaging in what, what is called fair use of others' marks. Um, and so the Jack Daniels case, the trademark case, uh, was decided, I think, about 10 days ago. And it's a case where a dog toy company sells Bad Spaniels dog toys, which is a parody squeaky toy. Um, actually, I don't know what squeaks. But it looks just like Jack Daniels. Um, it has similar branding, but it's a dog toy. Um, and, and so really important to the decision by the appellate court below was the fact that this, you know, one of the major arguments made in defense of this infringement was that this is a parody. Um, and there could be, you know, what kind of confusion could there be the likelihood of confusion between a dog toy and a bottle of whiskey, you know, sort of a, oh, come on folks um, approach. And the, the court was having none of it and said, absolutely, this is um, the, the potential, uh, the, the prime, primary fundamental function of trademark law um, is to identify the source of goods from one party to another and the similarity of the products does make there be a risk of confusion um, and was very, we had a very clear um, point made that the Bad Spaniels product was made for commercial purposes. And the court is I think going to signaling it and is telling the lower courts to be um, 
pretty strict in what they're determining to be a commercial purpose or a non-commercial purpose, meaning narrow, um, a narrowing likely of what we see as non-commercial purposes. Next slide, please. Um, I'm going to actually, I'm going to move on because I want us to sort of set out the, the parameters of the Warhol case before we turn to the panel, but we have some more and we'll talk about these takeaways with our crew here. Um, so let's go to the next slide, please, Maddie. So the Andy Warhol case um, was a copyright case. And this was a case that related to um, a quite, um, a, well, let's, let's start with the original creator and, and the person whose rights were vindicated ultimately in the majority opinion. Um, and that was a, a photographer by the name of Goldsmith who took a very um, you know, famous kind of definitive photograph of Prince who everyone should know is from Minnesota. If you don't, you know now, um, we proudly claim. Um, and and I have a story because he, he came out of the Wiper schools where my mom was a public teacher and his high school teachers told him he would never make money. Um, he needed to focus on school because he would never make money as a musician and they gave him a hard time. So he showed them. Um, that was not my mom was not one of those teachers for the record, but others that she she knew um, had had given him said said unsavory or, or unsound advice. Um, anyways, I digress. Um, for, the photographer had taken this photograph of Prince. Andy Warhol had um, done a silkscreen print in that same year. And it's important to note that the decision was not about Andy Warhol's painting of the photograph that was inspired by the photograph of Prince. Rather, it was the fact that the Warhol estate had licensed to Condé Nast to show the painting from Andy Warhol on the cover of a magazine. And that was a very important factor that played into the majority opinion. The other thing that's really interesting, I would encourage you if you have any interest in um, IP rights in more depth or you work at companies with portfolios or, you know, as I said, you, you, um, you know, you might want to be considering some of the increased risk um, that your company may face, really take a careful look at this. One of the things that's really notable about this opinion is that typical sort of jurisprudential allies, Justices Sotomayor and Kagan, are really locked in their um, majority and dissent. So Justice Sotomayor wrote the majority for a seven, you know, a seven justice majority, and Justice Kagan dissented, and they are really going at it over this. Um, and it's important to note that Chief Justice Roberts joined Justice Kagan's dissent. Um, and, and, that, and I'm going to turn with, the, with some of the fundamental premises of Justice Kagan's dissent. She has grave concerns about the harm to, um, she talks about the transformative nature of Warhol's work, and she has really, really big concerns about what this is going to mean for artists. So Fred, I'm going to turn to you on that. Um, there's a lot of taskers. Is, what's the, is that the right term, taskers? All right, I got it. So there's a lot of taskers who are artists, and more generally, I know that you are a lover of the creative, creative fields. Does this concern you as a human and a lawyer? And, and if so, why? Yeah, um, well, 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 first I'll say, having worked with you, Katie, at a, a Minnesota-based law firm, I, I came to understand the significance of, of Prince to Minnesotans. <laughs> um, I have fond memories of a party at some suite in downtown Minnesota in a hotel that was just Prince-themed and it blew me away. I had no idea Prince was even from there. Um, and I, well, I was educated. Know. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll say for me that my, my biggest takeaway um, from these cases is, um, especially depending on um, how they get interpreted and applied in future cases at the district court level, is that they could create significant issues for artists, but also, you know, more directly related to an in-house legal team, like creative people in-house or a marketing department going forward. Because um, I don't think the outcome here or the potential future outcomes here is generally aligned with what the public might expect. Mm -hmm. um, my, my sense is that terms like parody and fair use, they're, they're, in co they're common everyday words. A lot of people, especially in creative or artistic fields, are somewhat knowledgeable about them and think they have an understanding of what constitutes fair use. And I, I, I think you know, generally people might look at bad spaniels or this Andy Warhol piece and say, hey, that's that's totally fine. Um, and I think if you asked, uh, that's I think that's especially true um, if you asked someone from your in-house um, marketing team. Um, so I think going forward, it's going to be important to carefully counsel in-house creative teams 
on the impacts and implications of these cases. And frankly, the, the, the risk in the created by the uncertainty of especially this Warhol case, um, where, you know, I think there's some, it seems like there's a lot of gray area uh, between the dissent and the majority opinion and where that lands um, could be really significant. Um, it's, um, what was striking for me was this, this role of this licensing agreement and, and whether th the case would have come out differently had there never been a license agreement to begin with. And I think we'll see lower courts struggling with that. Um, you know, may maybe there are big risks here, maybe there aren't, but um, it it's, it's something that uh, in-house counsel should really talk to their creative in-house teams about. Those are great points. Thanks, Fred. Kate, what about you? Um, do you have any thoughts to add? What do you think companies should be playing close, paying close attention to when it comes to this pair of, you know, rather confident IP decisions from the court? Yeah, thanks, Katie. And I'll, I'll echo some of what Fred said, um, I, I just honing in on sort of the, the grayness that maybe some of this creates. And to me, and I'll just this is very much my personal opinion. This is not Chegg's opinion on these topics. Um, but these issues in both these cases are in some ways sort of a part of the cultural social wars that we see, you know, spinning down or out of the courts um, because there is very much the social question of how robust we want IP rights to be in this country. And I think because it's got that sort of cultural undertone, um, you see the strange bedfellows like a Kagan and Roberts, and then the decisions that come out the other end are muddier than where there's clean cultural lines. Um, and so what happens then is that spins down to people who are in house is that you have tension around some of the gray law that we're seeing out there. And so um, thinking a little bit to what Fred said, you know, I think you want to counsel folks around protecting your brand in light of these um, evolving norms around intellectual property rights. But then also on the other side of the business, perhaps as you innovate and move forward, you know, how do you ensure folks are protecting uh, or honoring fair use sort of standards as articulated in these cases? And so I think the, the tensions here and the gray here um, is a, a big impact for any company that has any sort of intellectual property rights underlying their work. Yeah, those are great points. Yeah, I think the dialogue, there's a lot of dialogue between Justices Sotomayor and Kagan, but I think some of it is about how broad or narrow the holding is. And I think we're gonna see a lot of, you know, perhaps more so than the, although I think there's still a lot of application to be done in the trademark context, but in terms of the Jack Daniels case, but in the copyright case, you know, I think there's there's a real debate between the two opinions of how broad or narrow, you know, the implications are going to be. And I, and I suspect we'll see a lot of potential for creative lawyering and frankly, just the appellate, the trial courts and appellate courts trying to figure out how to make sense of this in very different factual contexts. So thank you both Fred and Kate for those insights. We are ready for the next slide, please. And I think Lauren, you are going to talk about um, the riveting topic of personal jurisdiction, but man, this matters uh, for uh, for uh, defending suits. So take us away, Lauren. Sure, so our next case is Mallory versus Norfolk Southern Railway Company. And as Katie uh, foreshadowed, it is on the fabulous nerdy topic of jurisdiction. So the background here is that there is a Pennsylvania law on the books that requires businesses doing business in the state to register with the state. And once registered, this law purports purports to provide that the business has consented to general personal jurisdiction in the state of Pennsylvania. So the facts here are that plaintiff is a Virginia resident. Plaintiff worked for Norfolk Southern um, in locations in Ohio and Virginia. Note that Norfolk Southern is not at home in Pennsylvania, but nonetheless, plaintiff sued uh, Norfolk Southern in Pennsylvania State Court alleging that he had been exposed to toxic chemicals in the course of his work. Note that the course of his work did not occur in Pennsylvania. It occurred again in Ohio and Virginia. So plaintiff asserted that the court had personal jurisdiction over Norfolk Southern because Norfolk Southern had hundreds of miles of track in Pennsylvania and because it had registered in Pennsylvania. And therefore the law kicked in and had consented to personal jurisdiction. Norfolk Southern obviously disagreed. 
So the question before the court is, can a state condition a company's ability to do business in the state on its consenting to general personal jurisdiction or being at home in the state? Next slide, please. Uh, so I'm sorry, everybody, this is a cliffhanger. We don't have the opinion yet, so we don't know what the holding is. Um, however, what we do know is at oral argument, at least three of the justices appeared to be in agreement with Mallory, um, whereas three appeared to be very opposed. So we don't know where the court's going to come down on this. However, if there is a decision in favor of plaintiffs, um, this is a broad decision that could up and very longstanding um, our longstanding understanding of what personal jurisdiction is, everything that we learned in our first year civ pro class is out the window. So this question's for Jason. Jason, if the court sides with the plaintiff, the obvious implication, like I said, is that our understanding of personal jurisdiction is turned on its head. But what does that kind of seed change mean for the ways that an organization might have to manage its litigation? Sure. Uh, so, I, I mean, I, I think all of us probably took first year Civ Pro at uh, different points in the Supreme Court's development of personal jurisdiction. Um, I mean, I, I'll say, you know, uh, fairly early in, in my career, we had some decisions from the court like Daimler, like Bristol Myers Squibb, um, where it seemed like the court was, you know, putting more guardrails on personal jurisdiction and sort of more tightly defining, look, you know, there are certain places where if you want to assert personal jurisdiction over a corporate uh, uh, defendant, there are certain places that you have to do that. And the court was uh, giving, you know, giving the lower courts and giving state courts some clear lines that they had to stay inside of when, in doing that. Uh, in in my business, um, you know, where we produce uh, durable goods that are distributed by a network of, you know, dealers and retailers who are located in other states aside from ours, you know, that that trend seemed to reverse a little bit a couple of years ago with Ford versus Montana, uh, which is another personal jurisdiction case for all the PJ nerds out there, um, where, you know, that the, the court held that in those sorts of circumstances, you know, there could be a more expansive theory of personal jurisdiction that a plaintiff could use in that case against Ford Motor Company, which likewise sells durable goods with dealers all over the place. Um, but, you know, looking at that case, it seemed like it was, you know, you maybe you could keep that focused on a more narrow set of facts in those sets of circumstances. And, and I get what I see looking at Mallory is the potential of opening the floodgates uh, to some degree and opening, um, you know, the court swinging the pendulum back the other way for a variety of industries and saying, yes, you know, states can, um, using different statutory methods, um, you know, bring in companies in all sorts of industries into court, you know, regardless of whether the uh, circumstances of the case are connected to that state, uh, states can assert jurisdiction over those corporate defendants. And, and part of what strikes me looking at this case is that Mallory comes out of Pennsylvania and I think there was a comment in the oral argument from one of the justices saying, well, you know, it's it, the Pennsylvania has this fairly unique statute that by registering to do business in the state, you are consenting to personal jurisdiction in the state. And, you know, effectively, uh, it becomes a general personal jurisdiction where pretty much any case could be brought against a company there. The statute itself may be unique to Pennsylvania, but part of what I've seen and, you know, in Georgia is there are, you know, there was a fairly recent case that was cited heavily in the briefing for Mallory that came out of the Georgia Supreme Court that said, even though our statutes are worded differently, even though we have a different statutory scheme, we similarly believe, you know, and ho so hold that if you are registered to do business in Georgia, you can be hauled into Georgia courts to, um, to defend your product and defend your case. And the reason why I would call out that, you know, this is a case Mallory is a case out of Pennsylvania, and you have Georgia authority holding similarly, you know, even though it's on a slightly different basis here, 
if you look at the American Tort Reform Foundation's list of judicial hellholes, uh, everyone's uh, you know favorite list of jurisdictions where they like to be hauled into court, Georgia is number one, and Pennsylvania has courts that collectively are number two on that list. Huh. So even if you know you're looking at the other 48 states and wondering, okay, well, you know, does this really apply broadly? You've got two jurisdictions that, you know, you may not want to be hauled into court into where there is now potentially authority that a creative plaintiff can drag you into court there. So I do see that as something that, you know, I, I'm based in Georgia, so I'm already stuck with one of those jurisdictions. Yeah. But for other in-house counsel, um, you know, it, 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 it's, it's really worth closely watching this to see is, is that the reality you're going to be faced with in the near future as well. Right. And is this the sort of decision where you'd have to, you know, ha have some way of translating the import of this hyper technical, nerdy personal jurisdiction decision to stakeholders that don't have a legal background? I mean, that's a tough conversation to have. And I wonder how would you go about that? Uh, it, it can be. And, you know, I, I, I don't think I'm disclosing too many confidences by saying we have uh, a fairly senior executive in my business who was born and raised outside of the United States and uh, frequently comes to us and, you know, says, you know, none of this makes sense. Why do you guys do things this way? And, uh, you know, oftentimes those questions are hard to answer. Uh, <laughs> but, but when, you know, looking at Mallory in particular, if we have to have that kind of a conversation, um, you know, I, I do think that if this comes out in a holding in favor of the plaintiff in Mallory, there may need to be a conversation with, you know, with the executive team, with the finance team, when we talk about what, how cases are valued and how litigation is going to be valued going forward. Um, I, I do think there's going to have to be a discussion. And even if it is just boiling it down to a Reader's Digest form, to say, look, you know, cases in some courts are going to be worth more than cases in others. And now plaintiffs have been given a brand new tool to get into those courts where cases are worth more. Um, yeah, I, I do think that's a decision that's going to have to be communicated to, uh, to, to stakeholders in that way. All right. Thanks, Jason. Um, next slide. All right, well, this is a somewhat natural jumping off point um, because this next case also deals with sort of industry setting state regulation. And this is the case National Pork Producers v. Ross. This is one of the cases that the court has already decided this term. Um, also encouraging you to go into the recesses of your constitutional law brain to the dormant commerce clause theory, which is essentially um, that Congress is the entity and that regulates interstate commerce, and that's not the business of states and that state economic and other regulation that, you know, improperly discourages or inhibits or discriminates against out of state actors or inhibits interstate commerce. Um, that's a no no under the federal constitution. And so because of that theory and, and, and the dormant commerce clause um, implied in the federal constitution, the uh, pork industry with a lot of support from other industries, uh, brought this suit in California, arguing that California's sort of clearly industry, nationwide industry setting um, regulation of the sale of pork products within California, which essentially relate to um, concerns about how the pigs are treated um, before they are slaughtered, uh, said that if any pork is gonna be sold in, in California, it has to be that the pigs had to have been um, not treated or confined in a cruel manner as that law defines it. Um, and so a number of industry groups with, as you, you might imagine, this is a case with very, well, many cases are at the U.S. Supreme Court, but a lot of amicus activity, um, but a number of industries chimed in and said, yes, when, when California or other states set the standard, it, we have to meet it nationwide. That is um, requiring it's regulating beyond the state's borders of California, and this is infringing on the federal government's role uh, regulating interstate commerce. I'm not going to attempt to, um, we need a very complicated diagram of the number of opinions. Um, this is a case that was decided 5-4 
with Justice Gorsuch playing a leading role in, in what becomes the majority in opinion. But in order to really reach the majority, you have to sort of wind your way, take certain snippets of different of the different opinions in the case. Um, SCOTUS blog takes about a half a page of text to explain the opinion. So um, if that is in your interest, I will, I will um, suggest you go and do a deeper dive. But needless to say, there was a careful and complex majority opinion that at least in this moment has rejected this dormant commerce clause um, attack on the pork industry regulation by California. And, and I think interestingly, sort of, and, and I think arguably having some intellectual integrity and sort of the federalist approach of this majority, um, sort of saying, you know, if we're gonna punt a bunch of questions to the states, uh, this sort of regulation is one of them. And it was very important to Justice Gorsuch that um, it, it wasn't a regulation that treated pork producers outside of California differently than those originating in California. It's just that any pork that's going to be sold in California, regardless of where the originator is from, has to meet these standards. So at least short term, um, the, there is, I think, a limited ability to make dormant commerce clause challenges to industry setting state regulations um, and going to be some tolerance from the U.S. Supreme Court uh, to at least not stepping in the way of of that sort of regulation. And this is a big deal because there's a lot of, it's not just the pork industry, but um, there's a lot of, California is not the only, but is clearly setting industry, nationwide industry regulatory standards that impact um, companies that want to, you know, sell their products or do business in California. Uh, so I'm going to, I think, turn back to you. Let's go to you, Kate. Um, actually, sorry, Jason, let's, let's go to you. Um, what do you think about the the majority decision do you think this is a big deal i i kind of think it is but um maybe maybe i'm overstating it what do you think do you think there's important practical implications it, you know for now it, it, as i look at this case and i mean look you know between personal jurisdiction and dormant commerce clause it's sort of harder for hard for me to tell which one is the more esoteric and you yeah. know uh difficult to unpack uh um you know, set we of give you that we gave you the easy questions, Jason. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, I, I think we know who the nerd of the panel is. Um, but uh, no, I, I mean, when I look at the case and, and look, you know, trying to untangle these these various opinions, I, I guess it's you know, it seems a little anticlimactic in my mind that look, you know, the status quo was California, as you said, is sort of the de facto, you know, regulation setter. For many of our businesses, you know, I think of you know the the industry that we are in, and you know, there's any of a number of California regulations that apply to our products that effectively set you know the standard that we're going to have to manufacture and sell to because we're not going to have a 49 state product versus a California only product. Um, so California, you know, before this case kind of set that edge and after this case is probably going to continue to as a practical matter. Um, now, it, 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 that said, as, as I look at the opinions here, um, you know, it seemed interesting to me, Gorsuch, it seemed like wanted to go further and say that, you know, there's an entire category of dormant commerce clause uh, cases that, um, um, uh, that that pre could be brought under previous authority. Um, there's a whole category that Gorsuch seemed to kind of want to do away with and say courts courts don't have any business getting into sort of burden weighing and seeing, mm -hmm. you know, our states imposing undue burdens on out of state producers, even if it's a facially neutral uh, application. If Gorsuch had his way, that sort of challenge would have been thrown out entirely. Instead, you know, it seems like those kinds of cases, that kind of theory for attacking state statutes is still available. So, like I said, it seems kind of anticlimactic to say the status quo was, you know, if you think you have a really strong case, if you are really strong, you know, deeply impacted by a state regulation, you could, you know, with some creative lawyering, you know, with some uh, creative thought as to how you would go about framing that complaint, yeah, you could challenge under the Dormant Commerce Clause and try to, you know, get that regulation kicked. I think you still can. Um, 
And now you probably have a better idea of what the lineup for such a challenge looks like and what the lay of the land is for such a challenge, but it's still available at least. Right, right. I agree with you. I, I think that's that's an accurate reading it, from my read anyways. Um, you know, I just wanted, I'm going to turn to you next, Kate, but just before I do that, you know, I think that um, I was reading about some of the impacts of this. You know, I think it, certainty is usually, even if it's temporary certainty, I mean, some sort of certainty is usually helpful in terms of assessing risk. And I think there are some industries that are breathing a, a little bit of a sigh of relief in this. And here's why, because they have invested in um, process improvement and essentially meeting the standards of California in this instance, or maybe in a, in a different industry, it's a different state. Um, and, they, and, they, and they see a reason and a benefit of doing that in terms of consumer goodwill in other states as well. And if they no longer had to do that, they, they are essentially, um, they have to figure out, do they continue to, to invest in that sort of standard? Or is there now gonna be an argument that, that, that they're, for instance, I don't know, um, leaving money on the table for shareholders for doing that. So I think there, there's a short-term affirmation of investments that you know a number of companies and industries have made to really um, invest in, in meeting these standards um, that California may have set. And I can think of other in industries in which it's Colorado and others. Um, Kate, what do you think about, about this case? Do you, is there anything else that um, you can think of in terms of next steps coming out of this dormant commerce clause case? Yeah, you know, I just, I'll admit, I don't have anything smarter to say than Katie and Jason on this one. But to me, I just honed in on the, the never ending reminder to keep your eye out on your sort of outlier or strict regulatory states um, in ways that you aren't always thinking to keep an eye on them. Um, that has not changed. And I'm sure we're all doing it all the time. Yeah. The only other thing I'll add to that is that I, I think particularly after Dobbs, we, we will be seeing there's sort of discussion within the bar, at least in the appellate bar in my, in my neck of the woods and um, in some of the academia of looking at a renewed interest in developing state constitutional rights, particularly in the areas of sort of individual rights and liberties. And so I think that we, we will be as outside counsel and for in-house counsel paying more attention, not only to state regulatory action, but state uh, Supreme Court action and the ways that additional constitutional rights might um, start to be recognized, um, or at least some clarif clarification in certain instances from Minnesota. There have been instances where the Minnesota Supreme Court had interpreted aspects of our state constitution in alignment with the federal constitution. And it, it may be interesting, I think we're gonna see some instances where that, that assumption or the basis for doing that um, might start to part ways. So I, I think not only are we gonna to need to be watching state regulatory action, but also state constitutional developments in the near future. Maybe that will be another CLE for another year. Um, all right, I think we're on to the next slide in case. Okay, our next case is 303 Creative versus Eleni. This is a First Amendment case. We're just going full bore on constitutional issues today, I suppose. So um, this, is, this case treats the constitutionality of Colorado's public accommodation laws. So like most states, Colorado has a public accommodation law that prohibits most businesses from discriminating against customers on their, based on the customer's membership in a protected class. For example, their sexual orientation. We may recall back in 2018, there was a case at the US Supreme Court where a cake designer um, did not wish to design cakes for same-sex couples, uh, wedding cakes specifically, for same-sex couples based on his sincerely held religious beliefs that made him opposed to same-sex marriage. Um, back in 2018, the US Supreme Court gave the plaintiff in that case a narrow victory based on um, how the case was handled at the state commission level um, didn't actually treat the First Amendment issue before it. But here, the case, um, here's the background. So um, plaintiff has a web design business and she's in the business of designing wedding websites. She is a devout Christian and is opposed to same-sex marriage. So plaintiff does not want to have to design uh, wedding websites for same-sex couples. Um, she asserts that her right to free speech is violated if she is compelled to speak or to create wedding websites for same-sex couples. Um, because she insists that she she creates websites based on not not based on who is requesting it, but the message that 
the website would convey. So according to plaintiff, if a same-sex couple that operated an animal shelter asked her to um, design a website for that animal shelter, that would be fine. She would do it because she supports the message that um, an animal shelter conveys, you know, getting on how the animals housed. Um, but where a same-sex couple asks her to design a wedding website, she would be in, in effect um, uh, condoning the message that same-sex marriage is okay. So the question before the court is, do public accommodation laws violate an artist's right to free speech when the artist is required to accommodate customers whose message is contrary to their own? And this is another cliffhanger. We do not have the we do not have the opinion yet. It is still pending before the court. Um, <clears throat> but it is unclear based on oral argument what the outcome of this case will be. Um, so the more liberal justices took the position that this public accommodation law targets discriminatory, discriminatory conduct and only incidentally burdens speech. Um, but some conservative justices were a bit shy to full and adopt plaintiff's position that the law compels expressive speech in all sorts of circumstances. So if the court was to side with the plaintiff, the implications uh, would be that a public anti-discrimination anti public accommodation law, um, the status would be in a gray area, especially for employers who employ artists like universities, like spas who might have massage artists or photographers. Um, those sorts of employees could take the position that their performance of their art or craft um, is performing it as a public accommodation would require them to uh, speak a message that is contrary to their beliefs. So though we don't have a decision yet, this question is for Fred, and I think we touched on this a bit earlier today, but if there is a decision in the plaintiff's favor, um, and we have these sorts of implications that I just hinted at, um, what would an organization do um, that may not employ artists or that may not directly have this sort of concern? How might this impact your workforce? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yet, yet again, we're faced with a, another uh, LGBT rights case right in the middle of Pride Month. It seems like every other Pride, there is some sort of major uh, uh, LGBT rights case. Um, this is undoubtedly a decision, however it comes out, that will personally impact um, employees, um, especially LGBTQIA employees. And, and the good news is that we, we have advanced notice that something is going to happen. So there is still time remaining as a company and as in-house counsel to think about this decision and plan um, for your company's response. Um, and I, I think Cases like this, as I was mentioning earlier, are definitely ways in which in-house counsel can add, add value to a company's diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging efforts. You can pre-draft a statement that recognizes the opinion or like pre-draft statements going both ways and reaffirms, uh, reaffirms the core values of your organization. Um, you might take the opportunity to highlight for employees the work that your company might already be doing in this area. Um, and may maybe highlight some of your, um, you know, Pride Month activities if you're doing those. Um, this is, I mean, this aligning with this, uh, this decision aligning with Pride Month, I, I highlight that to know, you know, a lot of companies change their, their logos to rainbow during this month or make social media statements. Uh, it, it would, I would think it might ring hollow to your employees to not say anything about this having done that. Um, so it's it's really it's it's a necessary opportunity for um, a company and maybe for in-house counsel uh, to jump on. There's there's plenty of things uh, beyond what I just said that counsel could help with. You know, maybe um, go to your employees' cultural affinity group, like a, a pride group, and um, be part of some sort of educational meeting where you can talk about the opinion or just find ways to provide sp space for your employees to process. Any or all of these efforts can go a long way in, in fostering an uh, environment of belonging. Yeah, thanks, Fred. Those are all great ideas as we all wait this opinion. Thank you. Um, we can go to the next slide. All right, this is me. Uh, so another case that is still pending um, that's 
kind of at the intersection of arbitration law and also appellate law nerds, which just I, I'm currently working in both areas of law. So <laughs> that's why I'm covering this slide um, is the Coinbase case. Uh, this case, importantly, will decide when a party has moved to compel arbitration and the district court has rejected that, has said, nope, we think the arbitration agreement does not apply or the claim falls outside of it for some reason and has denied a motion to compel arbitration. But there is a non-frivolous appeal of that denial to a federal appellate court. Should the district court be stayed sort of as a right or what is the standard that the district court should use to determine whether that that case should be paid, stayed rather pending the decision of the appeal of the refusal to compel arbitration. And this really matters to companies and industries that, that frequently rely upon arbitration to try to manage risk and manage costs. Because if there isn't a, so this is a case where the district court typically stays, stays are an area of high typically district court discretion. Um, it's whether a case is stayed or not is typically one that appellate courts re review for an abuse of discretion and can be viewed as very fact specific. And this is a case where the district court denied the stay. And so while this appeal has proceeded, uh, there has been litigation. And the challenge for companies that you know have carefully crafted arbitration provisions and really rely upon arbitration as their primary dispute resolution mechanism is that if they have to fight the case out in the first instance in district court while they're appealing what they hope to be a successful um, motion to compel arbitration, you know it's not it's a hollow win at the end of the day if you know a year and a half later they get a ruling from a federal appellate court that they have to do arbitration, but they've had to respond to discovery and they've essentially had to litigate um, despite the fact that they ultimately prevailed on their arbitration argument. Um, so I think this is a case that has some really um, big implications for the law of arbitration and frankly for uh, how appeals will be um, will be uh, happening in the issue in the area of, of arbitration. We might see if we see um, a validation of a rule for um, a stay, a stronger presumption or some sort of standard for a stay, then we may see, you know, not surprisingly, then an increase in appeals, sort of like we see with denials or grants of motions to certify class actions, and really a, an additional um, a, an explosion, maybe that's an overstatement, but more and more appellate litigation in the federal appellate courts about a motions to compel arbitration. Um, Jason, I think you were the one who had a particular interest in this case, and so I, I'll turn to you. Um, can you say a little bit about why you think this is an important case and why you'll be watching this carefully, as I understand that you will be? Yeah, uh, so, so, you know, this caught my eye in, in large part, you know, for some of the reasons that you've outlined already, which is that, you know, when a business enters into an arbitration agreement, when we have arbitration clauses that, you know, we have, uh, uh, in our agreements, you know, the point of that is, is to say, you know, we don't want to be in either state or federal court. We would like to be in an arbitral proceeding for any of a number of reasons, whether that is, um, you know, quicker resolution, whether that is a more cost effective resolution, whether it is, um, you know, potentially it is, um, a contractual relationship where there is confidential materials being passed back and forth, and we would like to have any dispute involving those materials to take place in a private setting, rather than one where we're going to have to worry about, okay, are these materials going to be handled under, under seal? Are they going to be put on PACER for everyone to see? Um, you know, that there's, if, if we include an arbitration clause, there's generally reasons for that that are incompatible with going through the discovery phase of federal or state litigation, um, while this appeal, which you know takes place under provisions of the Federal Arbitration Act, um, while an appeal is pending, so uh, if if the court comes out and says no, you know there is discretion for the district court to not state a litigation while that appeal is pending, it does raise some questions in my mind about you know. Are we getting what we bargained for necessarily out of an arbitration agreement if you know there is a denial of a motion to compel arbitration and an appeal takes place coming out of it mm -hmm. in terms of drafting these clauses um 
Katie, I don't know if you have different thoughts, but I, I mean, I look at it and I think, you know, if you're going to go ahead with an arbitration clause regardless, if the court says that a district court need not stay under these circumstances, I don't know if there's a whole lot we can do about that in the four corners of an arbitration clause. Um, you know, part of the beauty of those clauses is that we can spell out and we can say these are the rules that an arbitration panel has to follow or that an arbitrator has to follow. But just because you and I, as counterparties in a contract, yeah. agree that, you know, hey, maybe a stay should be entered, maybe appeals should be handled this, this this certain way, we may agree on that, but a district court doesn't have to follow the processes right. that we spell out for, for ourselves. So, I, I mean, in, in terms of the language of agreements themselves, I don't know if there's a lot of change, but it the outcome of this case may affect the calculus of what are you getting out of that clause in the first place? Yeah, well, I certainly think if we see, so two points. One, I think that if you look at the reports of the oral argument, this is a really interesting case because the the, the justices who we would typically think of as being more the, the more liberal justices that would be more concerned about arbitration and wanting more robust access to courts, um, were making very textualist arguments about the Federal Arbitration Act because they were saying, listen, when you know we have we have language in the federal arbitration act that suggests that congress intended there to be stays in certain instances and this is not one of them and so i think you know conversely the the, the justices that you know maybe really favor robust arbitration are finding themselves needing to contend with some pretty compelling textualist arguments about the statute and so whether they might sort of say this is for congress to fix um who knows if, if the you know maybe we'll see a begrudging um, you know, a begrudging uh, defeat for arbitration in this context with a call to action on Congress. And maybe that's something that there could be a bipartisan support for. Um, so uh, the second point I want to make is your question about what, what might be done. I mean, I, I certainly don't think it would hurt if, if the court goes in favor of, as you said, a, continuing to allow discretion and not sort of requiring um, a stay of the district court. I don't think that it would hurt for the parties to even be more specific in arbitration clauses going forward to say, notwithstanding this, you know, this this rule, um, we agree to we agree to you know stipulate to a stay. But but again, we don't know how that would be interpreted, right? So that might spin out a whole nother um, realm of litigation issues that would need to be sorted out by the courts, and that frankly might be just sorted out differently circuit to circuit, which is always a challenge for companies that that work in many different circuits. So. Um, but we'll be watching this one closely because I think it will it will have an impact either way for sure. All right, let's go to the next case. And Lauren, I really want to make sure that we um, can get to the affirmative action cases. So I'm going to suggest since we have a little more than 10 minutes left, oh, we don't even have 10 minutes, that we be quick on this one. Sure. Okay. So um, I'll just do a quick coverage of it and we'll um, not have too big of a conversation on it. So. Um, the background here is, all right, the False Claims Act encourages whistleblowers to file suit on the government's behalf where the whistleblower sees or suspects uh, wrongful behavior that harms the government. So under the False Claims Act, um, after filing suit, the government has 60 days to choose to intervene or take over the case or to let the whistleblower continue on their own. If the government does decide to intervene, they have dismissal authority where they could, if they wish, dismiss the action. So here, the plaintiff brought a False Claims Act action. The government decided not to intervene and sent them on their merry way to litigate it themselves. A year into the litigation, the government uh, believed that the case was meritless for um, a variety of reasons and sought to intervene. That motion to intervene was granted, and then the government moved to dismiss the case over plaintiff's objection, or the real, sorry, not plaintiff, the relator's objection. So the question is, does the government still retain a dismissal authority if they opt not to intervene at the outset of the litigation, but instead do so when they intervene later? So we do have a holding in this one, as opposed to my cliffhangers I've gone through. We do have a opinion here. The holding is that the government may move to dismiss whenever it has intervened, whether at the start of the case or sometime later. And Jason, I know that this case caught your eye and, um, uh, the practical effect of the holding in the government's favor interested you. And so if you'd want to share your thoughts on that. Yeah, just just very briefly. Uh, I, I mean, it does seem to 
um, provide, um, you know, plaintiffs or relators in FCA actions with, uh, um, you know, an additional hurdle that they have to get past and that the government may have discretion to jump into an FCA case later on in the process and uh, uh, bring it to a stop, get it voluntarily dismissed under a relatively low standard for doing so. Um, so it does increase the risk on the relator side of bringing these actions. It also potentially gives defendants, corporate defendants in such an action, an avenue to say, let's have a creative discussion with DOJ and see, you know, are there interests of the government in not having the case proceed that should be brought to their attention and potentially have DOJ come in as an ally in getting that case dismissed. Great. Thanks so much for those thoughts, Jason. Katie? Thanks, Lauren. Next. All right, Mandy, next slide, please. All right. So I think it's my personal opinion that although there are a lot of important cases coming um, yet in the next probably week and a half, realistically, I, I'm not sure that any are as significant in terms of their ability to impact um, society and law um, than the affirmative action cases, which are a pair of cases relating to Harvard University and the University of North Carolina. And the issue, this is the sort of next iteration um, of the Grutter and Gratz cases, which were decided um, about 19, almost 20 years ago now, um, where the Supreme Court, and that was, a, as you may recall, that was an opinion, those opinions, um, you know, were, there was, there was an anticipation of a moment where the, the majority in those cases sort of said, well, we hope in 25 years we'll be past the time where we need to um, have remedial measures that expressly consider a candidate's race in higher education and, and the society writ large. And um, in both that moment and in these present day cases, um, you know, as I, as I think we all know and, and would agree, you know, we aren't over racism, or at least that's certainly my position. Um, and there's a lot of continued, um, we of course have the Black Lives Matter movement, that re, um, reaffirmed focus on um, sort of structural barriers that communities of color faced. And um, I, I think a moment where we have a majority that is highly skeptical of any use of race, and um, Justice Thomas is particularly passionate about this and has has written and spoke about um, how he, you know, how he feels that he was harmed by affirmative action because it meant his peers undermined or didn't view him as being there as of merit um, and being really a, a person who has personal and, and ideological concerns about any sort of race-based distinction. Um, and so we see these pair of cases in the Harvard instance, because it's a private school, um, we see the challenges being um, brought under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act um, that their admissions um, policy by expressly considering race, even as one of many factors, is violating that um, federal civil rights law. And then in the context of the University of North Carolina, um, as a public school, the argument that any facial consideration of race in admissions decisions violates the Equal Protection Clause of um, the 14th Amendment. And uh, this was a five hour, there's a great article on it at SCOTUS blog, um, you can tell I like SCOTUS blog, um, a five hour oral argument um, lots and lots of swirling ideas. You know, even the the advocates representing the universities, um, they are arguing for a very limited role that race should play and a strict, um, you know, everyone is living in the land of strict, strict, strict scrutiny, um, but in continuing to explain why universities in most instances feel they need to be able to consider um, the racial and ethnic background of applicants as one of many factors. Uh, and, and I think it's possible that we could see somewhat of a split decision. It's possible the majority could decide to dodge the um, 14th Amendment question and try to resolve it more narrowly. That was one of the um, issues bandied about at the five oral marathon oral argument. So, um, but this is, you know, I, I guess I would just, as to the human point we're making about all the stakeholders and in organizations' lives, um, to remember that this decision is, you know, it's coming year after Dobbs. It's coming at a time where state legislatures in many states are coming after LGBTQ communities. So um, many people live in intersectional identities. They do not just experience one of these cases. They experience all of them and or those they love do. And um, I think this really is going to be, in my opinion, a moment where, um, yeah, not saying anything is saying something. And uh, we're, we're, we're going to have organizations looking to their leaders, and I think law departments are one of those, 
Um, so I think, I guess we're asking all of you heavy questions on various topics. <laughs> um, but I think this one, we were gonna go to Kate. We haven't heard from you for a while. Um, what, what do you think that in-house folks might wanna be considering about this? And I'll be quick, looks like we have one minute and Katie, I wanna make sure you get a chance to show your code here, but um, you know, this, uh, Kate, that's, I'll just st state that, you know, the we're not going to be shut down in one minute. So we'll wrap up, but it's sorry. not like we go black. So we can control that. So finish your thoughts. And this is, this is a really important case and folks can also disengage if they need to. So, yeah, um, I just contrary to everything I said earlier about like issue spotting this one, actually, I, I thought about very narrowly and uh, the impact sort of on two constituencies that I would face in house, which are, you know, employees, as Katie mentioned, and um, how that might affect someday down the road the makeup of you know recruiting and what the employee workforce looks like and then also consumer base depending on the industry you're in in mine you know we support university students what does that look like what does that mean how are users consumers going to be impacted differently and then how does that roll down to you know the products they're using which sounds kind of crazy when you start thinking about something as um big as this, but it, it happens. Thanks, Kate. Before I, I'm gonna ask you if you have anything to add, Fred, but before I do, I just wanted to note, um, if anyone does have to sign off right now, the second code is 93821. That's 93821. Um, and Fred, uh, you can, even though we're showing the slide, you know what we're talking about. Um, anything you, you wanna add to, um, you know, this really, this big important case that there's gonna be strong opinions, however the court decides it and what that might mean for um, in-house folks. Yeah, um, thanks Katie. Um, and I, I think, you know, I, I don't wanna sound like a broken record. A lot, a lot, of, a lot of my thoughts on this are things that I, I've said earlier about um, just, you know, saying something internally and addressing this issue with your em employees, however this comes out um, is, really significant. Katie, you made a really excellent point, which is not saying something is saying something. Um, so it's uh, it, it being neutral in, in, when cases like this happen is just not an option. Yeah. All right. Well, um, we are at our time. We want to respect everyone's um, everyone's time. So let's go ahead to the, um, the code. Uh, we didn't cover um, a couple cases. Uh, there's Never a dull moment. We've got some interesting cases about the independent state legislature doctrine and about defamation law, which is actually quite riveting. Um, so there's not not um, not a dull moment. So I want to thank. Uh, I just can't thank enough our panelists, Kate and Jason and Fred. Um, it's been really lovely spending this time with you. I know how busy you are. I know how much your organizations rely upon you, um, and I just thank you very much um, for your time. Thanks for being with us. Um, I will just leave the final um, housekeeping, the closing housekeepings that um, we appreciate your attendance today, that um, we will take your, some of your Q&A we weren't able to get to, we will do our best to follow up with you with those answers. Um, please keep an eye out for a follow up email from our webinar today, which will provide you access to the slides. Um, and finally, um, feel free to reach out to Lauren and I um, about any other questions or if you, you have any next steps or you feel like you need some, um, some guidance on, on any of these issues. Um, and if we are not able to serve you, we will um, certainly rely upon our very um, talented colleagues to do so. so. So thanks again. Thank you, marketing folks. We couldn't have done today without you, um, Chris and Sophia and Madeline. So take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.